What's up everybody, GenX Dividend Investor here. In this fun video I cover the good, the bad, and the ugly of SCHD, JEPI, DEVO, and VTI, all of which are popular tickers to own amongst the dividend community. So if that sounds like a fun video to you, then please hit the thumbs up button, subscribe if you haven't yet, and click that bell notification. And before you complain that you shouldn't compare a covered call ETF to a total stock market ETF to a dividend ETF, well I'll just respond by saying no soup for you, because that's what I'm going to do. Now in my title I ask which one of those tickers wins, but the reality is that with investing, winning is a subjective term depending on your needs and goals, thus what's winning for one person might not be winning for another. But we can still analyze things like total returns over time, expense ratios, dividend growth, and other important data points that we investors care about to help us figure out if an investment makes sense to our needs. Okay, and I'll start this video by first talking about VTI, the Vanguard Total Stock Market Index Fund. We see its performance has gradually trended up since inception. It's got a super low expense ratio of 0.03%, aka 3 basis points, which means that if you invested $10,000 into VTI, then Vanguard would withhold $3 of your returns each year, on average, as a management fee. We also see that it pays out quarterly, and its trailing 12-month dividend yield is only 1.58%. So if you wanted to retire on dividends with VTI, you would need a lot of money. We also see its AUM, or Assets Under Management, is a high $285 billion, which means lots of people invest in it as that represents the total market value of VTI that Vanguard manages on behalf of their clients. Typically, investment products with high AUMs have higher market trading volumes, making them more liquid, meaning investors can buy and sell the fund with ease, and I personally avoid things that don't trade a lot. You can also see that some Seeking Alpha analysts have it as a hold right now, seemingly due to fears of recession becoming more likely. I'm personally fine to keep DCAing into an ETF like VTI, because I believe in it, and in fact it's the ETF that I usually recommend to newer investors whenever I can, whether that's a random Uber driver I meet or whomever. Like I sometimes volunteer my time at a tech startup founded by a former colleague of mine, a startup that I now own a few percentage in due to me providing some guidance to it in its early years, and at a lunch meeting we had, I pitched VTI to a newly hired college grad who was curious about investing. Now I don't own VTI, so why would I recommend something I don't own? Well, if you've watched my channel for a while, then you'd understand that my needs and goals and risk tolerances are unique to me, and my goal is to influence the world to invest intelligently, and I believe that the easiest way to achieve that is with an inexpensive, broad market index like VTI, rather than going with individual stocks like I do. But I like my portfolio more than VTI, and I've configured my taxable account to automatically transfer dividend cash straight into my checking account, which also means that if something happened to me, then my wife and kids would still magically have a checking account that keeps filling up with cash. And no, it's not really magic, nor is it free cash, but it is like magic and free cash to my wife, who's never logged into her burgage app in her life, nor even thought about selling a stock. That power and flexibility of true passive income providing for my family, even if I'm not around selling shares, is something I value greatly, and reminds me of a couple years ago when I was at my CPA's office, and this elderly lady was there and talking quite loud, and I overheard that how grateful she was that her late husband had set things up for her to get dividend cash automatically and continually. Each payout was another happy reminder of what her husband had created for them. That amazing reality of dividend passive income is one I never hear the dividend haters talk about, as they only focus on how you can sell shares to make your own dividend. But the reality is that knowing how to sell a stock, or knowing what stock to sell, or knowing when to sell are all extra hurdles and complexities that can often be avoided or minimized if you have a quality basket of conservative blue chip dividend stocks. Anyways, I digress. Now we all know that the US stock market has had pretty incredible long-term performance, and while there have been and will be periods of weak performance, why do I think it will continue to be a good place to invest moving forward? Well the reason is because of how strong US companies are, companies that hire bright people that build amazing products and offer valuable services. And so while past performance can't guarantee future performance, I think it often can help paint the picture for what future performance may be like. I mean a company that has been performing well for decades probably will continue to perform well, even though it's not a guarantee. Okay, so VTI is Vanguard's total stock market index, and it holds thousands of equities in it. Its prospectus says the fund employs an indexing investment approach, designed to track the performance of the CRSP US total market index, which represents approximately 100% of investable US stock market, and includes large, mid, small, and microcap stocks. 100%! So now I have a fun quiz question for you. Take a look at my portfolio of dividend stocks that are listed here from my largest position on top to the smallest on the bottom. Pause the video and then leave me a comment telling me if you think that I have any tickers that aren't part of VTI, and if so, which ones. And don't look at other people's comments. Now that was obviously a trick question, because VTI holds 100% of US public companies, right? Well, not quite. Did you figure out which ticker I own that isn't in VTI? Great job if so. 
but not as great as the person who identified which two of my tickers aren't in VTI. Seriously, give yourself a hand if you correctly name two of the tickers I own that aren't in VTI. But if you're a total smarty pants, then you manage to name three of my tickers that aren't in VTI. Everyone should give you a standing O for that. But if you manage to correctly identify the four tickers that I own that aren't in VTI, then you get a flyover in your honor. That's right, folks. There are four tickers I own that aren't in VTI, aka the total stock market index. So what are they? Well, VTI doesn't hold any ETFs, so my SCHD position is not in it. And that's one. Next, VTI only has US stocks, so my British American tobacco position is another that's missing. That's two. That also means my Toronto Dominion Bank position isn't in VTI either. And that's three. But what's the fourth one? Well, the last tricky ticker of mine that isn't in VTI is none other than a recent one I added and talked about in my video last week called $98,800 of dividends per year for my $2.8 million dividend portfolio, and that's ticker EPD aka Enterprise Products Partners LP. And why would that be? Well, surprisingly, it turns out that no MLPs are part of VTI. Here, I'll prove it by asking our AI overlord. So I click on my special Microsoft Bing browser, special in the sense that this particular one I'm using is a development build that has a ChatGPT button on it, and I ask it if MLPs are part of VTI. And voila, Mr. AIBot responds that master limited partnership companies are not part of VTI. And of course, since AI is never wrong, you can take that answer to the bank. Seriously though, I didn't realize that MLPs aren't part of VTI. I mean, VTI even holds REITs in it, and pretty much we all say that VTI basically holds all US public companies, but I guess that because of the novel tax implications of MLPs, along with the fact that MLPs are partnerships and not companies, might all be reasons why EPD isn't included in VTI. So congrats if you named even one ticker of mine that isn't in VTI, as I bet that 99% of people in the world could even get one right without totally guessing. And if you got even more than that, then that's amazing. Moving on, when we look at the top holdings of VTI, we see big companies you'd recognize. So like Apple is 6% of VTI, then Microsoft is 5%, etc. VTI is market cap weighted, which means that the amount of each company it owns is about equal to the size of that company relative to the overall market. One observation I want you to take away from this list is that the top 10 positions in VTI only add up to about 23% of it. Compare that to the top 10 in my dividend portfolio, which make up 60%, thus some would critique my portfolio as being too top heavy. Or to say that another way, VTI is very diverse. And there are always ways you can make your portfolio more diverse beyond just your top 10. Like VTI doesn't hold international stocks, and if you wanted more broad exposure you could go with the Vanguard Total World Stock Index Fund ETF, ticker VT. Now if we dig into the dividend tab, we see it has a decent 5 year dividend CAGR of 6.62%, and it's paid a dividend for every year it's been out there, i.e. 21 years, but it only has 2 consecutive years of dividend increases and it pays quarterly. But most people hold VTI for the total returns, not just its dividends. When we look at its holdings, we see the tech stocks that are about 26% of it, followed by healthcare at 14% and financials at 12%. If we look at the total return of VTI since it came out a couple decades ago, we see it's at 447%, which is about a 9% annualized return over multiple decades. Total return is stock appreciation plus dividends, so if you invested $10,000 into VTI about 20 years ago, you'd have around 55 grand right now. A great thing about VTI is that it's a passive index, and thus doesn't require humans to do anything. Okay, now that we have our baseline VTI out of the way, let's move into SCHD, a stock I'm long in. SCHD is Schwab's US Dividend Equity ETF, but there are other popular ones out there including DGRO, VYM, VIG, and Noble to name a few. SCHD was started in 2011 and attempts to track the Dow Jones US Dividend 100 Index, which is a variety of criteria it uses to automatically pick stocks. We can see its stock price has pretty much trended up since inception, with the hiccup at the pandemic crash, and it has a nice low expense ratio of 0.06%, it pays out quarterly, has a 3.57% yield, and has 47 billion assets under management. We also see that analysts and quants have it as a buy. There are 100 stocks in SCHD, 61% of which are large cap, which I prefer. If we look at the sector weightings, we see tech is the largest component at 21% of SCHD, followed by financials at 20%, and then consumer staples at 14%. Let's check out a dividend overview page of SCHD on Seeking Alpha. Here we see that it has an awesome 5 year dividend CAGR of 15.5% and has 10 consecutive years of dividend increases. And surprisingly, this momentum page shows us that SCHD has returned 307% over its lifetime, slightly outperforming VTI at 293%. It doesn't mean it'll continue to outperform in the future, but it's still pretty darn impressive. 
I think the ideal person for holding a large portion of SCHD would be a retiree who seeks conservative, relatively safe dividend income, along with potential for ongoing growth to beat inflation as time goes on. I'd probably still push VTI over SCHD for younger people, even if SCHD has outperformed so far, simply because it's very hard to beat the market over the long term. But would I be okay if a 20-year-old wanted to invest in SCHD? Sure. I'd even be fine if my kids wanted to hold it. That being said, one of my concerns about it is that I'm not a big fan of financials, and they have a big weighting in it. But no biggie, I probably need to increase my financials ownership regardless. If we look at SCHD's top holdings, you can see that these are all blue chip names you'd recognize, including a few I'm long in such as Pepsi, Pfizer, Coca-Cola, etc. Now I'd personally rather see Apple and Microsoft instead of IBM and SCHD, but if they did that, they'd lose some yield in favor of greater probable stock appreciation. And that's another example concern of mine, i.e. that SCHD doesn't always pick what I feel are the best stocks. A concern that some people have is that SCHD's top 10 positions are almost 40% of the portfolio, which they feel is too top heavy, as compared to the 23% we saw in VTI, though I'm personally not worried about it given my portfolio has an even higher top 10. Moving on, this shows us that SCHD has a relatively low turnover of 13.5%. Turnover is a measure of how frequently assets are bought and sold by the fund. A higher portfolio turnover may indicate higher transaction costs and may result in higher taxes when fund shares are held in a taxable account. These costs are not reflected in the annual fund operating expenses. Okay, now let's move on to Devo. Devo is an actively managed ETF of high quality large cap companies with a history of dividend growth along with a tactical covered call strategy on individual stocks. So that means you get dividend income plus covered call income to gas your returns. One nice thing you can get from options can be lowered volatility in beta. Devo has only been around for a few years, but it's gradually trended up other than the pandemic crash. Its expense ratio is one of the highest in the video at 0.55%, but it has a nice low beta of 0.62, and my dividend portfolio is at a 0.67 beta for reference. It pays out monthly and has a nice 5.05% yield, along with 3 billion assets under management, which is getting light, but you can still see it has decent volume. Seeking alpha analysts are split between buys and sells for Devo, landing on hold as an average. I think the bears are worried that we might be entering a new era of growth, thus dividend stocks could underperform, whereas bulls like it for all the stocks it holds and the income production. If we click on dividend view, we can see that its trailing 12-month dividend growth rate is a low at only 1.37%, but its 5-year dividend CAGR is a nice 13%. We also see that it only has 2 years of consecutive dividend growth, which means the distributions are going to be lumpy. Devo's stock selection process tries to identify high-quality, large-cap dividend companies that have decent growth. We see it holds 32 stocks, with many classic dividend stocks I'm long in like Microsoft, McDonald's, etc. When I look over its holdings, I realize that I'd be fine owning it for my own. Now, some people won't like that their top 10 holdings are 51% of Devo, but again, that doesn't bother me since they're quality positions. Its sector coverage looks good and roughly aligned to the overall market. One interesting observation I had was even though Devo holds many strong dividend growers, the actual distribution amount isn't increasing that much over time. Like here's their payout history over the last three years and it kind of meanders sideways. I was chatting with someone a while ago who owned Diva and they did their taxes and he saw about 50% of it was ordinary income, 35% was qualified dividends, 8.5% was long-term capital gains and about 5% was return on capital. Devo has some tax documents on their site, which varied a bit from what that guy actually saw, so if you want to be conservative from an estimating perspective, then assume higher levels of ordinary income, as that tends to be the worst rates. And in fact, when I was looking over their tax documents, I noticed a ticker I hadn't noticed before, which was iDVO. It looks like iDVO is a new international version of Devo, which just got released, so it holds ADRs. One question I have is how international dividend withholdings work if you held an ETF like iDVO. Anyways, since I need to increase my international exposure, something like IDVO might be interesting for me to dig into more. Let's take a look at total returns of Devo as compared to VTI. Devo came out around 2017, and since then it actually outperformed VTI with a total return of almost 105%, as compared to VTI at about 97%. Nice. Of course, who knows what's going to happen going forward. Some people think we're headed for a bull market in 2023, with growth stocks dominating, while others out there talk about recession again, and how things are going to tank around the world, and then of course others think we're going to go sideways. So will growth have dominated for most of the year when we tick into 2024, or will value and income strike back? I personally don't care, as one of the things I like about quality dividend stocks is that they tend to pay out and increase their dividends, often regardless of what macro things are happening around them, and over time quality dividend stocks tend to outperform. Okay, now let's move on and take a look at JEPI, which is JP Morgan's Equity Premium Income ETF, another popular and pretty much well-liked high yielder out there. Take a listen to one of the managers of JEPI, Hamilton Reiner, where he's talking about what he's doing that is a little bit unique with JEPI. 
So when I think about traditional call overriding, and I've been investing in options and, and equities for over 30 years, traditionally a traditional call override strategy foregoes some of the upside in return for getting income, but unfortunately too often it eats all the downside. So we start with an underlying equity portfolio that's more conservative in nature, higher in quality if you will, with a hope, and in most cases in a situation where you won't eat all the downside. So Jeppy seeks to create an actively managed portfolio of equities consisting significantly of those included in the SP500 total return index and through equity linked notes aka ELNs selling call options with exposure to the SP500 index. I'll elaborate more on ELNs shortly as they're a rather interesting and unique financial product. Jeppy has an expense ratio of 0.35% which is high relative to VTIs but is still reasonable given what they do and it's a monthly pair and has a trailing 12 month yield of over 11% which is crazy high along with $24 billion of assets under management. Now, 2022 was a great year for Jeppy as the market tanked and things were volatile, but even its managers say that a more normal yield expectation is something like in the 7% to 9% range, so adjust your expectations accordingly. Jeppy holds around 130 positions, including blue chip dividend stocks I own like AbbVie, Coke, and Pepsi, and own some non-dividend stocks like Google and Meta and Amazon, amongst others. One thing to be aware of with Jeppy is that it has a pretty lumpy monthly payout history. Now if we look at the top 10 positions in Jeppy, we see that they only add up to about 15% of the overall portfolio, so no top heaviness there. But note the high 195% turnover ratio. A turnover ratio of 100% means the ETF has bought and sold all its positions within the last year. A relatively low turnover ratio like 20% is more of a buy and hold strategy, whereas a ratio over 100% means more trading than holding. And why should you care? Well, more trading often means more fees get taken out, and those transactional fees are not included in the expense ratio that they normally publish. High turnover can also sometimes mean more tax implications. Anyways, Jeppy looks for quality stocks at attractive prices that have lower volatility, and they limit each stock to 2% of their portfolio so that no single position can dominate too much. And they try not to go over 17.5% in any single sector, and you can see how tech is their biggest weighting at around 15%, followed by healthcare. Jeppy has a nice low beta of 0.8. Now here's the total return graphs of Jeppy and VTI, and it starts in the middle of 2020 when Jeppy sprang into existence. Three years isn't too much to draw broad conclusions on, but we can see that Jeppy's total return was 38.6%, approximately the same as VTI at 38.7%. Note there is a similar version of Jeppy in a mutual fund called Jepix, and it has been around for a few more years. Let's take a look at Jepix's performance to understand how Jeppy might do under a broader time frame. Here we see that Jepix had about a 10.3% CAGR, including stock appreciation and dividends reinvested, versus VTI at a 13.5% CAGR. So Jepix's total returns are less, but you are getting more income and less volatility. Jepix is something that I feel that retirees and people who need income could consider more than someone who is trying to grow their net worth. Let's dig into Jepix's usage of ELNs for a bit. ELNs, aka equity linked notes, are structured as notes that are issued often by banks that are designed to offer a return linked to the underlying instruments within the ELN. Jeopardy's ELNs are specifically designed to combine the economic characteristics of the SP500 index and written call options in a single note form and are not traded on an exchange. Investopedia says, equity linked notes provide a way for investors to protect their capital while also getting the potential for an above average return compared to regular bonds. In theory, the upside potential for returns in an equity linked note is unlimited, whereas the downside risk is capped. Even in the worst case scenario, most equity linked notes offer full principal protection. I read a MarketWatch article where one of the managers of Jeppy said that they used a covered call options strategy by purchasing equity linked notes, which combine equity exposure with short put options, and that the fund invests in ELNs rather than writing its own options, because unfortunately option premium income is not considered bona fide income. It is considered a gain or a return of capital. Or to say that differently, one key reason they are using these equity linked notes along with pure dividend stocks is so that their distributions come out as ordinary income and qualified dividends rather than return of capital and capital gains. I've never owned Jeppy but I talked to a guy who does and he said something like 85% of his payouts were at normal ordinary income rates while 15% were qualified. And qualified is usually taxed at 0, 15 or 20% whereas ordinary federal income tax brackets vary from 10% on the lower end all the way up to 37% at the upper end. I'm not a tax guy, so take that for what you will. But a takeaway is that the income you get from Jeppy is taxed poorly compared to something like pure qualified dividends. Anyways, Jeppy limits their ELN usage to be at most about 20% of their portfolio, and they tend to be at 15% overall. They get these ELNs from established institutions like Barclays, National Bank of Canada, and others. 
part of my concern is that I don't have a good handle on the full risk implications of their ELN strategy. And of course, you could counter that by saying that worst case, it's only a minority of their portfolio. Now, I've met people who go into JEPI with 20% or even more of their portfolio, and I personally caution against any position being more than 10% of your portfolio. That doesn't mean you have to do that, that's just me. Over time, I hope to become more familiar with JEPI, and maybe at some point in the future, I'll dip my toes into it. Another newer JP Morgan product with even higher yields is JEPQ, but that's for another video. And now for fun, let's look at total returns of JEPI, VTI, SCHE, and Devo all on one graph. Unfortunately, since JEPI has only been around for a few years, it limits the usefulness of this comparison, but we see that JEPI had 38% total returns, like VTI, and then SCHD came out on top at 55%, and Devo was second at 47%. And of course, some people like to mix and match these ETFs. So maybe 25% JEPI, 75% SCHD, or 33% DEVO, 33% whatever. Some people like to hold them in their retirement accounts, tripping them, and others are using them as income in their taxable accounts. But who wins? Well, that really depends on you. Each ticker has its pros and cons and risks and issues, so familiarize yourself and then determine what makes sense for you. If I had to pick one general winner, then VTI would be the one that I'd recommend for most people most of the time. If someone was looking for a strong dividend ETF that provided good qualified dividends, then SCHD would come out on top for me. If they were looking for more yield from a standard covered call ETF and were okay with normal taxable income, then Devo might make more sense. And if they're cool with equity linked nodes and maybe are a bit more aggressive, then JEPI might fit their risk profile. Of course, don't forget that you can also spend time to learn how to do basic options and do them yourself rather than invest in a covered call ETF. But some people would rather golf or whatever than do options, so to each his own. Regardless, please leave me a comment telling me if you own any of these tickers, as it's always fun for me to hear what my subscribers are invested in. Also, leave me a comment if you think I should go into any of these tickers, and if so, which one? And with that, I'd like to close things down and remind you not to forget about my Seeking Alpha referral link. I've recently become a Seeking Alpha affiliate, and they currently have a sale running where new people can sign up for their premium membership for only $99 for the first year, starting with a 7-day free trial that you can try and cancel if you don't like it, versus the normal $239 a year that I've paid for years. It's my favorite site for stock information out there, so I'm cool pitching it. They mentioned that they'd probably be changing this offer soon, so verify what they were offering if you decide to try my link. Finally, I'd like to thank CookieMonster71, who just boosted my Discord server and is a Patreon. Which reminds me, I highly recommend that you join my free Dividend Discord chat server, which has over 10,000 dividend investors on it from over 70 countries around the world. And if you made it this far in the video, then please hit the thumbs up button, subscribe if you haven't yet, and click that bell notification. Thanks for watching, stay positive, and I'll talk to you again real soon. I am not a financial advisor, and these videos are for entertainment, inspiration, and educational purposes only. Investing of any kind involves risk. I am only sharing my opinion with no guarantee of gains or losses on investments.